Let's see what time it is. Ten fifteen. You know, the place is closed at three. I gotta take a shower before that, so maybe two thirty or whatever. I don't know if you're gonna be hungry or leave or whatever. We'll figure it out. Yeah, I mean, whenever you have a course, you have a curriculum. It's like when you have a, a calendar. You plan on meeting so and so, waking up, brushing your teeth, and doing all that. Things get a little uh, hectic. You forget a couple things, or you don't make it. But you have a plan. So I put something on a plan somewhere. You know, uh, I jotted something down and all that. But now, you know, you have a few people. You want to see who the people you have, and what you can accomplish. You know, in Prama Ga, the idea is to teach somebody how to defend himself as quickly as possible. If you have more time, if you have one hour. If you talk to somebody on the phone, you can give them advice. If you have uh, an hour, you give them advice on part of the stuff, and you train him in the rest, some mechanics of, of impact. I'd rather do impact because everything else is easier. Impact is more complex. What is, what is impact? Punching somebody or kicking somebody, that's impact. Or elbowing somebody, or headbutt, or even jumping on him with your whole body to make him fall from somewhere. It's impact on the whole body. Uh, so you want to have an approach, you want to know what it is and all that. So, I mean, let's, let's go back to history. What is Krav Maga? It's just an A, four letters, and, you know, multi, uh, to, to the square root, two, four letters, you know, different letters and all that. Like any other thing, hand to hand combat, whatever, karate, I don't know. So the advantage of Krav Maga, uh, let's go back to uh, Second World War, the Nazis or whatever. You know, it was a political thing, to start a political thing, that award and mass killing. Uh, but you had all these brainwashed young Germans or whatever, or whoever joined them, they called the Nazi youth gang or whatever. Uh, you know, like any other gang, they go and beat up people for fun. They use a bike or a train, whatever they have, and sometimes they hand. I mean, what's, what's their background? Some of them just beat, beat kids from a young age. Some of them they did wrestling, they did grappling, they did boxing, whatever was available in Europe. Uh, so they could have gone to the same gym or in, you know, and learned grappling, wrestling, and then try to beat up the Jews because that's who they picked on. Uh, and and it, you have the Jewish community at some point that started getting the, the athletes to defend them. You know, it was like their family or their community, and, and they're waiting for them, basically. Um, you know, they're, they're looking, the, the Nazi gang were looking for, for them, and the leaders or the, the, the athletes were, were looking to fight back. Uh, so, so you have, you know, except aside from Germany, all the other European countries, it's like you have a Gestapo officer that comes and sit in office, He's, you know, they try to persuade the leader of that country somehow to go with Hitler, and, and they, have, they have all kind of side activities, you know, they're planning on it and they, they're beating people up. So, I mean, Imi was uh, a good athlete. He won a couple championships in wrestling, uh, boxing. His father was a police officer that taught jiu-jitsu. I mean, he was fond of jiu-jitsu. He was a, a detective in a Bratislava police. And, you know, Imi learned from him. He, they had a, a gym. It, it's like the Police uh, Benevolent Association that teach police officers, but it was a private gym. His father, besides being a police officer, he, he was part of a traveling circus at some point. Uh, what kind of a circus? You know, they probably had animals and all that, but they, they did athletic, all kind of uh, gymnastics that, you know, you just hold somebody's body up in the air. Uh, and, you know, all kind of uh, that type of display. Uh, I don't know if they, they, you know, did rope or whatever, but I'm sure it's part of the practice, you know, training day, they climb rope. Uh, he also won a couple uh, swimming competitions, but he said, you know, it wasn't his thing. You know, it was good. And so, it just happened, you know, there might have been other people somewhere else that assumed the same role of leadership. It just happened, uh, you know, uh, in the last couple of years, somebody else is, is uh, describing one of, he didn't like to talk about it, but some, describing this fight, how two Nazi youth came to beat up, he's coming out, and the idea is, Imi was training them, he said, we cannot do any fighting sport, we have to modify it, we have to attack first, no rules, and uh, you know, you have to have an advantage. So, 
they basically beat the two Nazi kids. It was in a newspaper and all that. Uh, it wasn't even, it was, you know, one of his students. And, and this guy, you know, man, describing, you know, how he trained them and all that, and, you know, how he got them together and, and gave them an explanation of how you fight these people. And they were lucky enough to, uh, uh, you know, the local police arrested them, and they actually protected them from, from the mob. They wanted to uh, uh, lynch mob them or uh, lynch them. And mob lynch them, and uh, somehow they they were at night time to let him go because the charges were not pressed on time, and they, they got a, they suggest the local police suggested that they will leave the country, and they did. So that's how we have that story. Uh, Imi's family, you know, all his family that stayed in Europe, died in the Holocaust. He took one of the last boats from Hungary, from Budapest. <coughs> I don't even know it was Hungary at that time, and immigrated to Israel. It was under the British mandate at that point, and he, he got caught. And usually they used to catch the immigrant and put him in a detention camp. I don't know what they did with him after, in Cyprus. <coughs> and he was given the ultimatum to join the, the, the British Legion. So, you know, they have troops of people that spoke foreign language or whatever, or had a little bit of experience, or, or just volunteer. And uh, originally, I think, they wanted him to serve in somewhere that, where he could speak it. Like I don't know. Somehow he got. I think he, he served in in the Middle East somewhere uh, for about two years, and then still he got there before 1948. A couple of years before, he was uh, allowed to settle down in Palestine. So he got to Palestine, uh, and he started training the underground, the Haganah, whatever. What was he training them? How to use a knife, swimming, um, jujitsu probably, and you know, fight with a stick, you know, handy objects or whatever. And and then when uh, you know they, they have a couple of people, a couple of people that are athletes that had a, a background in wrestling, boxing, and and other stuff. And, and they, they changed it a little bit. And and then when Israel became a state, he was chosen to to be the head of the, the Fighting Fitness Academy on the hand of physical fitness in, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now back then, it was short courses. He used to teach them how to use a knife uh, in the military. Before they used to teach them uh, how to use a stick. Uh, and after a couple of years, it, w it was developed, you know, and it was mostly the obstacle course, you know, and measurement of pulse, you know, time, and all that stuff. Then they start navigational, uh, Run. We actually, somebody has to run from point A to B with a map and find his way, and you know they would time it. Uh, and, and, and later on, the, that uh, fighting fitness academy developed, and it included the uh, Krav Maga, which was used, you know, traditionally a small uh, unit. It was like usually a chief instructor and assistant, and then we're like. Uh, you know, tons of fitness instructor that used to stand on a line and check, make sure you're, you're past to all the points you're supposed to so you don't cheat, and, and check Margaret and check your time with a stopwatch. Uh, you know, they wanted to uh, upbeat the, the fitness of, of the IDF. And, and they had specialized courses, swimming, uh, lifeguarding, uh, diving, uh, well, I mean, they had the Navy SEAL, they had everything there. Uh, no, they didn't have diving. Uh, they, they had a shooting instructor, teach you how to target shoot. Uh, I mean, each unit had the sergeant teaching you how to shoot and all that, but they, they you had to pass at some point, or they sent some people from the whole military to, to become a shooting instructor. And, and whoever completed that course, it was similar, but not exactly the same, as uh, Sky Marshal. Sky Marshal uh, deals more with uh, uh, combat shooting, and, and over here it was also snipering. So it was a combination of snipering and combat shoot, shooting in, in a, in a in two or three weeks course. Uh, you know, you just take your time and, and you, you just do your training. And uh, also pistol, you know, they have a little bit of pistol, but in Sky Marshal they do a lot more. 
uh, oh, and uh, grappling, uh, mountaineering, you know, climbing mountains and all that. So they used to, for each, uh, in a, all the specialized courses, they had one chief instructor, and sometimes they have an assistant, sometimes not. So they would have a special unit of 20, 30 people, or from a few units, come over there for, for three weeks and hang out with this guy. It's like a group leader. And he would take him slowly and, uh, you know, mountaineering, grappling and all that, climb mountain and descend and all that stuff. And uh, so, so that was it. That's the Fighting Fitness Academy. Now, they have about two or three officers in the Krav Maga department and they do nothing. Supposedly, you know, I mean, people are getting stabbed all over. Soldiers are getting stabbed. Nobody knows exactly what to do with it. But I, 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 I became a... Uh, the Krav Maga chief in the 80s, it was, uh, I think, 80, 81, and I was there for two years. It's like the guy before me that replaced him, he retired. Uh, you know, I came over there, the assistant instructor trained and sparred with me on the lawn, and I said, you know, I came over there because I got sick of doing ambushes in Lebanon, I was doing for three. I did ambushes for, for a couple months after six uh, months training. Uh, and I got sick of that, so I said I wanted to spend the rest of my two years, you know, a place I could shower every morning. And uh, so I got there, and uh, I was sparring with him, and I saw it's e it's so easy, and I wasted seven years in martial arts doing full contact fighting and everything else. Um, so you know, then the Elia Rizara, the the guy that replaced him, he re came back from vacation, and he. Uh, he said, my name is Eli, uh, I heard you have a black belt in uh, Kyoko Shin from, from the other guy, Dennis Hanover. I said, over here we just do very nice, over here we just do Krav Maga, nothing else. You're gonna, if you want to stay here, uh, you're gonna, my assistant is going to show you how we teach it. Before the, the class, you're going to have a lesson plan, you're going to teach the, the training step, and that's it. And then in a couple weeks, there is a Krav Maga instructor course, three weeks, you're going to take it, you're going to be certified, you're going to start teaching instructors courses. I said, fine. And, uh, you know, I was hooked, and, and that, that, that's how it went. And I took the instructor course, and then I started teaching my first instructor course. He used to come at the beginning for the first couple lessons, uh, and sit there, and then, you know, once in a while, he, he did an inspection. And, and after a course or two, he stopped coming. He used to meet me in the morning, he was about to retire six months ago, and uh, the assistant instructor retired. And, uh, and I stayed with the chief. So for a few months, and, and I was on my own because he used to come to the civilian portion of, of the base. I used to cross the fence, sit in a cafe with him, and I used to cover up for him. He said, you know, if any of the general was gonna come over, just tell him you just saw me, you just talked to me. And it was fine with me. And then I used to, they suggested I'm gonna come to his civilian school, which was an hour bus ride, uh, twice a week at night, and, uh, and get a belt in Krav Maga. I realized that in the three weeks course that I did, I learned more than and they learn in five years and all that with all the belts and all that. So I mean, let, I mean you, you put the pieces together. I mean, in the last couple of years, 10 years, I've published a book describing all the experience and my conclusion from that. Uh, but the advantage of, of being chief instructor in the military is, is a few things. You know, I mean, you can go to a martial arts school, you can get balance, you can uh, do championship and all that until you win. And you keep wondering why this guy is a champion and I'm not, until you figure it out, either you become one or not. Uh, but in the military, I mean, you have to do sparring. Usually at a course, you have people that took the Krav Maga course and people that already have a black belt somewhere else. And uh, it takes longer to get rid of you know, bad habits or sports habits. Uh, you know, you just get into ha doing things in ha of habit. And you see that in a short course, usually the people that just, you train it for three, three weeks, it's fine. They would either knock out or, or prevail with, with people that did martial arts. You know, whether it's wrestling, grappling, boxing, uh, or, or karate, or Muay Thai, or whatever. Uh, you know, you, and in a soldier, people are more moder motivated to, to kick each other's ass and all that. Uh, especially special units and all that, and everybody try to pick on an instructor. If you're in a special unit, whatever you think you're better than anybody else. So it's a good challenge, but also it's a, it's like a, with witnessing experience. You're witnessing history. You have thousands of soldiers coming in to train, and over a couple of courses, couple of years, it just registered and you draw a conclusion. 
So a guy that did it for 20 years, and then a guy who replaces it for, for another 10 years, uh, have a lot of experience. You know, obviously you're motivated, you're training your own country soldiers to prevail. So if you have a backline martial arts or whatever, you know, you think you're going to use that and all that. Somebody already thought about it before you and had the experience, and you agree with them that that works better. Mentally, I mean, you have people that don't, and then you have a problem. You have people that, that never were, were never introduced to what was developed there. When I left, I had no replacement. I mean, I had, I trained a lot of people that just couldn't figure out who to call. So they called somebody that went to a civilian primary grad school from one of Amy's students. I mean, when Amy retired from the military, uh, you know, he, he opened like a fitness school. He did gymnastics. He, he taught gymnastics, a little bit of uh, judo, jiu-jitsu, karate. He mixed things up. And uh, at the beginning, he didn't call him karma. After a couple of years, he called it, but he didn't want people in civilian life to do exactly uh, what they do in a Krav Maga school. I really don't believe that he just tried to waste people, he wanted to waste people's time. He had a hard time. He thought that Krav Maga was so good, it, was, it should be a secret within the military. So, I mean, over the years, you have people that were black belt under his black belt students and never taught in the military. And once they get a black belt, you see him doing a seminar. What is he teaching? A proper punch or a proper kick. Something that you learn on the first hour in the military. Because everybody did it differently. And a lot of emphasis points that if you don't do it right, you get hit. Or you have a less, lesser chance to prevail. So, I mean, what is a te technique? Technique is a mathematical equation. How to get from point A to point B. How do you learn math? With, with one equation? No, you have to understand the theory, you have to, you have a lot of formula. It's like a formula. A technique is a formula. Formula to get from, you know, in one method, or one point to another. You have to know them all in order to, to, to know math, to solve problems, you know, to, to know you can solve all problems. And, and if you want to solve a problem of, that has to do with another person with two arms and two legs coming to reach your pressure point first, you need to reach his pressure point first, and you control him with a pressure point. If you grab somebody by the finger, it hurt him so much, he doesn't want to hit you, we'll find it out later. If you knock him out, he's not trying to hit you, he's not trying to stab, stab you. Even if you hit him hard enough, he's still shocked. You know, he wants to, but he can't. So, that's, that's the idea, control somebody with a pressure point and not letting him hurt you with your pressure point, you know. Uh, and that, that's what you, got, you want to do in a short amount of time. If you have all time on the wood, you know, you can suck high math, you can develop it, uh, play with it, and what if. But in the end, it's, if you're away from each other, nobody can reach. I mean, anything that has to do with a, like a firearm or whatever, it's, it's not hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's shooting. It could be of self-defense, you could have a little bit of, uh, with a reaction time, which means it's all from a distance, you see somebody, uh, he's standing like that, you don't think he has a weapon, suddenly he draws a weapon and shoots you. Do you have the time to draw a weapon? Yes. Uh, depend when. Well, well, no, if he draws it and shoots you immediately, you don't. But, but if he's pointing the, the pistol at you, he's not shooting yet, and he's telling you to do something, or oh, I'm going to kill you while he's talking or while he's asking you to do something, you have time to put a bullet in if you're accurate, if you have good skills. So it's part of it is reaction time and common sense. Uh, uh, but, but anything that you can reach somebody either with your arms or with an object, whether it's sharp or blunt, this is considered hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it's controlling somebody's pressure point with your bare arm or something. So, you know, what, what do you need to learn with it? You need to learn navigation. How to move around his arms or, or, or his body without him reaching your pressure point and how to reach his pressure point first. Now, some pressure point, you don't need, uh, you know, all you need is explanation and try it a couple of times. Windpipe pluck, if you can get your fingers over here, you can pluck the windpipe and, uh, you know, it'll turn the cartilage, it'll obstruct the, the breathing. Uh, you know, somebody still have oxygen in their body for about 15 minutes, uh, but they're going to drop, they're going to lose consciousness because the body preserves it, so keep the brain alive. Uh, so, but you need to come and grab it. From a distance, it's better to use impact because if you lunge with a punch and you knock somebody out, 
uh, it's much quicker and harder to, to stop when somebody grabs you. If somebody grabs you, they have to first grab and then start manipulating. If you, if you restrict their hand, you still have a chance. I mean, obviously, you need to deflect the impact before it gets close to you. If it gets too close and you decide, I'm, you wait for here, you say, once I'm going to see it right on my nose, then I'm going to deflect it. Uh, you give a command to your hand, you come in great reach here, the hand comes up here, and obviously you're already knocked out. So you have to know when to, to stop it. And it, it happens so fast, so you just have to be trained to reach over here, and then it's gonna come here. It's, it's, it's like when you cross the road, you estimate when the car is gonna reach you. If you're driving uh, 60 miles an hour, it's far away, and you cross the road. Once, it, once it's here, if you cross the road, you don't have much of, of a chance. So that, that's what it's about. <coughs> so we have a couple of hours. Let's see how much time we lost or began. Okay. What we're going to do today, I'm hoping we're going to stretch so we don't hurt ourselves. You know, we're going to do all kinds of stuff. Uh, I'm hoping to go over a little bit of impact, punching, and kicking, uh, pressure points before. You know, give you an idea how somebody can hurt you or, or how you can hurt somebody else before they hurt you. So it's how to reach pressure points, we we'll learn how to deflect them if somebody try to reach yours. Uh, uh, I mean, somebody can use constriction, you know, put their arm around your neck and, and choke it or manipulate your, your spine, try to break uh, your cervical spine. You have a lot of nerves in here and if you, you know, you break the cervical spine, I see you can die. Uh, you can become a handicap, or you can also die. You know, probably will. Uh, and you know, so so we're gonna, gonna get a good idea of of how somebody can attack us and how uh, we can fight back. And you know, we can you know, when you take it 21 hours, you get a very good idea. We just have a couple hours here. We do whatever we can, and you want to keep your mind open. I mean, if you read the book, some. Some people that uh, wrote a review said that they learned more reading the first 60 pages of the book uh, than training two years in Krav Maga. Why? Because they came over there, they did all kind of aggressiveness, uh, drills, fitness, and you know nobody really showed them how, how to generate impact, or nobody showed them what's a pressure point, and uh, you know, they didn't get the, the general idea. I mean, you can have an, a half of idea. Somebody is going to do something that you have no clue he's going to do it. And you need to, you know, to have an approach, a comprehensive approach, inclusive. 